All right. All right, we're going to get started. If you can get to your seat. Get it rolling. Cool. Um, hey, y'all. We're going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to start singing. All right. Father God, thank you so much for life. Uh, thank you so much for friends and family and being able to provide for ourselves and being able to provide for others, Lord. I pray right now for um, really quick uh, uh, Ophelia, who is, uh, I believe, in the hospital with some respiratory issues. Uh, please, please be with her family and her uh, as she recovers. Uh, be with the doctors, be able to, you know, make sure that she comes back 100%, Lord. I pray for today. Uh, one, you know, it doesn't pour on us as we leave <laughs> later on, but <laughs> uh, that we also are able to fill this place with nice warmth. Um, warmth of friendship, warmth of, warmth of your spirit, warmth of uh, fellowship, and warmth, warmth <laughs> of singing, Lord. I pray this, all, pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to start with some a little high energy. How y'all doing this morning? Y'all okay. doing good? Hey, y'all glad you came? Yeah. Come on yes, now. Sir. It's gray outside, but it's sunny in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. We're going to start with a song. We're going to start with a little bit of community, all right? There's songs that we sing right to God. There's songs that we kind of sing, like, with one another. You know what I mean? So don't be afraid to, like, grab somebody. <laughs> Unless you don't know nobody. Hey. <laughs> Single brothers, don't be grabbing. Anyway, okay, just, just grab somebody, sing this song with people, and it's going to be awesome, all right? We're going to start with Take the Lord With You. You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. Out in the street, in the street, in the hole, in the hole, on the job, on the job, all alone, highway, highway. The songs of the Lord rise in the joy of our King. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let 
the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh. Let the songs of the Lord let them rise. rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord let it rise. rise among us. Let the joy of our King rise among us. Let it rise. And we're singing, oh, 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 oh. let it rise. Let it rise. Let it rise. Oh. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs, let the songs of the Lord, let them rise. Let the songs of the Lord, let it rise. Let it rise, rise among us. Oh, let, let it rise. rise. Sing it, oh, 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 oh. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise.
Strength in every heart, I worship. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause that is who you are. That is who church uh, for you guys that don't know me my name is Khalil uh, hey. <laughs> um, yeah so uh, Jeff asked me to do communion um, about two weeks ago and in that time I didn't know what I was going to talk about but uh, Lord gave me an opportunity to share something that I experienced with you so um, for currently right now I attend OMSL we just started classes about two weeks ago, and I was a little bit nervous. I was nervous because there was a class that I took the previous semester. It was a statistics class, and I struggled with that class. I love math, but I just I couldn't grasp that class for like anything. And I, you know, I did YouTube. I did I did everything. And you know, thank God, you know, he I was able to pass the class. You know, but um, I thought I was done. Uh, <laughs> But I'm not. <laughs> I'm in another statistics class this semester, you know? So um, I'm like, I'm sitting there the first week, and I'm like, great, you know? <laughs> Lord, what am I, what am I gonna learn in this class? And um, then the uh, professor began to speak, and uh, English isn't his uh, first language. So it's kind of difficult to understand him, because he has a very thick accent. 
And I was like, okay, Lord, like, I already don't understand the class, and now, like, I can hardly understand my professor. Um, how are we going to do this? And um, I was upset that entire week because, you know, I was like, this semester, you know, I really want to do well. And we had a greenhouse retreat uh, that Saturday, and um, Vince talked about dignity. So coming uh, into class Monday, I sat there, and, you know, I was just thinking about, the things that, you know, my professor had to do to get here, you know, to the States. Because this was his first time teaching, you know, in the United States. Uh, he came from Brazil. He's taught in Europe. Um, moved back to Brazil, and now he's here. And I was just like, man, this man, like, pushed through a lot of fear. Um, you know, it took a lot of courage to, you know, just get in front of us and teach something, not in his language, you know, and, and, um, and, and it rocked me. It rocked me because... You know, I could have I could have been more graceful, you know, towards him and and the uh, you know the language barrier. And um, when I think about that, I just think about how you know Jesus was graceful to me. Um, some of you know my story, some don't. Um, I hope I get the opportunity to share that with you guys one day. But just thinking on you know Jesus' life and you know how he lived and. You know, how he was mocked, you know, ridiculed, you know, talked about, shamed. And even up, you know, until his death when he was on the cross, um, you know, uh, he was up there. And while these people were doing that, you know, uh, Luke 23, 34, you know, he, he asked out, you know, to his father, like, you know, God forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And, and you know, his life was just, you know, a testimony of just, you know, how graceful he was, not to just, you know, his disciples, but to, you know, everyone. Um, and so with that, what I want you guys to uh, get from this is that, you know, Jesus Jesus sacrificed a lot. You know, he, he did a lot for us. And, you know, sometimes sometimes we can, you know, take that grace for granted. And, and, I, and I definitely did, you know, that week. So I encourage you guys to, you know, you know, search in your hearts and and really, you know, see, you know, what areas in, you know, your heart that you have to, you know, improve on or prove in. Um, because, you know, we're we're all imperfect, you know, we're all working, you know, towards the glory of God, right? Um oh, that's all I have if y'all would like to join me in prayer. <laughs> uh Lord, I just thank you, uh for everyone being here this morning. I thank you just for allowing us to make it safely. Um, God, you're just so amazing. You're so amazing. Um, we're just, you know, everyone that's that's here, um, everyone uh, heart. And in this moment, Lord, I just pray that, you know, we can come to you, God, knowing that you sent your, you know, son to die for us. And we really look at that as a, as a moment of just, just gratefulness, God. I pray that we open up our hearts and we really search those areas that that are unholy, you know, in your eyes, God, and, and we can really just confess that to you, God, and move forward, you know, from today in such a better light, God, loving just everyone unconditionally. I pray this in your holy name. Amen.
Good morning, church. Well, for those of you that don't know my name, it's Forrest Booth Jr. Make sure you add that Jr. because you'll get it confused with my father, and then you'll get it confused with my brother. I know it's the whole thing. <laughs> so I've been a disciple for six years now. Totally awesome. They let a kindergartner on stage. <laughs> and I work with the kindergartners. Let me tell you, the stories go on. But, you know, in being an educator, you give your time to listen to those stories. And the, the title for today's message is The Aroma of Your Heart. What is the aroma of your heart? I mean, this is St. Louis, y'all. We're known for our barbecue. Okay, you know, those side dishes and all that, okay? So now let's put this into perspective. You've got all this nice weekend Labor Day barbecue, right? And then you've got this four-day-old cabbage in the, in the trash that you've been meaning to take out. Okay, so, so now one is good, one is bad. So in the offering, which I'm so blessed to be able to give this message today, I have to look at myself, and I, and I tell you, there are times when I have struggled. I have struggled a lot when I give my offering, because life as an educator is not easy. It never is. And just having, not having that paycheck until all the way until the 15th of September, it's rough. And let me tell you something, this church, the people in this church lift me up. One, Tony Thomas, are you here today? Tony, if you're here, thank you so much for discipling me and saying, Forrest, you need to tell people what you're going through because not too long ago, Vince was preaching, hey, don't let pride control you. Don't let pride dictate how you live your life as a disciple. So I was feeling really low. And I... and. The brothers that I talk to, the sisters that I talk to, you know what I'm talking about because you saw me at my lowest. And how does this all come to offering? Because putting the trust in God, offering time with your fellow disciples, offering time to those who aren't disciples. You know, um, <clears throat> that good aroma, how does God see you when you give your time, your money, to help further the kingdom? Because in Leviticus and in Numbers, it was drilled into the Israelites on how to give their offering. There was a process. But then when I look at, when I look at Scripture and I look at uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And, the, and it goes on to how... It, your supply will be increased. It goes on that because of the service that you give, your heart will turn to joy. Others will praise God because of what you give. You know, and so when <laughs> Bill met with me Tuesday, and he says, hey, Forrest, I got an envelope. I want to meet you with you, and I want to talk to you. And so we do. He said, hey, someone just gave me this envelope. I don't know what it is, but I felt like, you know, a drug mule here, $200 to help pay for my rent, someone else just gave $200 again, that covers almost all my rent, and then I get help from my family members, and I'm like, I can pay my rent, I have a place to live, I don't have to worry about uh, my, my property manager coming and hey, you owe me rent. You know, giving to further the kingdom is so important. Your time, your money, anything that you can give that glorifies God, please do it. Because it has made me realize that that weekend barbecue, I want it stained on my heart for God. 
I don't want that four-day-old cabbage. <laughs> really don't. No amount of shower will remove that. So uh, let's go to prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us a heart to give. Thank you so much for allowing others to come forward and help. Thank you so much for the blessing that you continue to give because of those that give their time, their money, whatever it is that honors you, that others will praise your name, that you are glorified. Thank you for allowing us to be able to give so that in those moments we can be different, that our hearts can change because in those moments we become more like your son. So please help us to continue to do so and be a light to the world in our giving. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. And just so you know, you can give online or if you'd like to give in person, there's a black box next to the door over there. Love y'all. Amen. Amen. I definitely want the barbecue. Let me just put that out there right now. All right, I'm hip here for announcements. We do have a men's uh, fellowship breakfast coming up this Saturday. Oh, I'm sorry, not this Saturday, but Saturday the 17th at 9 a.m. Uh, right here in the, in the fellowship hall. So this is for all men, 18 and up. So please plan on being here. I heard that the last time the lesson was amazing. Hadrian did a lesson on prayer that uh, really moved all the men's ministry. So great stuff is happening there. So uh, men's fellowship breakfast, Saturday the 17th at 9 a.m. Uh, the coming up midweeks uh, in September, we have our men's midweek on Wednesday, September 28th at 7 p.m. Uh, so let's go ahead and plan on that uh, uh, for the end of the month there. And we also have a special meeting uh, today uh, for the young marrieds uh, called Lifted. Uh, that'll be here uh, in the upper rooms from, or I'm sorry, so 12 to 1.30. So go have, go get lunch, come back, and have a great time of fellowship. Go ahead. All right. So most of you know my love is theater. And most of you know, I love kids. So last year we had a pretty good show, right? Yeah. Well, it's back. And this year, we're starting early. <laughs> no four week rehearsal and put on a show. So um, this year I actually have Erica Willis helping me out. So she's got a lot of theater, theater experience as well. I've already incorporated everybody I need. Um, but what I need is the kids. So this includes K, through 12th grade, includes you guys, I need you. Please come and audition, okay? Because there's going to be a lot of little kids on the stage, and so you're going to help me out, right? But, so let me tell you a little about the show so you can get excited. So it's called No Vacancy, right? Well, you all remember this taxes, you know, the census that every, everybody had to go to Bethlehem. So the town was about to be overrun by a ton of tourists. Well, the animals in the stable, well, they had some feelings about that. So, you know, Sarah and Seth, the sheep, they just thought, oh, God, everybody's going everybody's to want sweaters. And then there's Claude the cow. Well, she lost 10 pounds last year because everybody wanted milkshakes. <laughs> and then there's Micah. Now, Micah's the mouse, and he's fearing that, yeah, there's a lot of tourists, so, oh, my goodness, there's a lot of scraps. But then there come the mouse traps. So the whole purpose is it's all throughout the eyes of the animals and they scheme to figure out how to get these animals or these people, these humans, out of their city <laughs> until they're, in, you know, thrust upon these humans moving into their house and having a baby. So it is hysterical. It's funny. But again, we are having auditions on September 25th from 1 to 3. Kathy, she is so amazing, made these awesome little cards that are going to be out in the foyer for you to pick up. There is a QR code you can scan, and you can schedule a time for your kid to come in 10-minute increments from 1 to 3 on September 25th. Everyone will be a part of the show if they want to be, but not everyone can have a speaking role, so you better come with your A-game on. They, We need you guys, but 
please, teens and preteens, I need, need, need you. What did I say? Yes. yes. So come. And here's what's even better. This is open to our community. This is an outreach program. So if you have a friend who may not know Jesus very well, invite them to come and audition and be a part of the show so they can be loved by us and see the love of God in this show, okay? All right. All right, let's all stand for one last song before the sermon. yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. And He will lift you up. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 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 That saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 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 Who was blind, but now I see. Who was blind, but now I see. Ten thousand years. We've been there ten thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years. Bright shining, shining as the sun. Bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise. Days to sing God's praise. yourself in the sight of the Lord
That's all right. Whoops. Drop the mic. All ready. Well, guys, we are beginning a little journey together, and that is life without the Hawkins for about three months. And uh, this is uh, a really proud moment, I believe, for the church, uh, because it really is a sign that uh, we are maturing. Amen. You know, we're thinking long term, how do we take care of those that are going to be taking care of us for the long game? Uh, it gives a sense of making sure that those that are up here have the right inspiration and the right heart and aren't just driven by agenda. That kind of purity of thought can only happen when you find that balance of rest as God intended and your value as God intended, not as producers, but as those that trust God enough to really let him take the wheel. Thank you, Carrie Underwood. <laughs> but I'm proud of the church. I'm proud of you guys saying, let's make room for this. Let's make sure that... Uh, we're, we're going to feed the soul so that that, that soul can then feed us. Amen. I also think it's a great time for us to kind of kind of step up and kind of go, wow, there's going to be room to kind of come into this thing. I know so many brothers have come up and said, hey, man, if you need me to preach, if you need me to preach. And I'm like, you know, I've been doing this for a little while. <laughs> but I, I will honor the requests and make sure that we do have a good rotation, even though I am slightly offended. Amen. We're, uh, we're starting a uh, new sermon series this week. Uh, it looks like, Tyler, I'm going to need you to kind of advance me here. Called From Page to Person. You know, it's, it, it's, one, of those, it's one of those things when we kind of think of what does the world really need? It's got all the information it could ever hope for. I mean, we have the mind of God in the palm of our hand that can look up every detail of everything at any time. At all times, we have access to all the information we could ever need. The fact that our brother had to, had to, had to struggle in statistics and yet not even YouTube could help him is a little bit of a miracle because you can do everything through YouTube. But faith is kind of like that. It, it is hard to figure out. And the greatest need in the world today is for people to be able to live this out, to be able to see it on the page and then to see it in their life. Today, our first sermon in this, in this series is entitled, next slide, The Renewing Power of Living Out Scripture. The Renewing Power of Living Out Scripture, because that is really what it is all about. And this came to me while I was at the conference, uh, next slide, because I had one of those moments where I saw scripture being lived out. It was in this, it was in this moment where it was uh, the worship night in between the two conferences. The, the way that it worked, in case you didn't know, is that the first half of the week, we had the, uh, the campus, the singles, and, uh, and the leaders all together, and that part of the week was hype. I mean, the hallways were loud and obnoxious, just like you want it to be. It was, it was like from the days of old where you were walking up to the building and you could hear the fellowship roaring in the hallway. And in fact, even when you go into your class to try to preach, you could hear the fellowship in the hallway, just like in the good old days when people sort of showed up to class. It was awesome. And then in between, uh, in between that conference, the second half of the week was, uh, was the marrieds, the forever faithful, uh, the death track was there. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was exciting, but not nearly as energetic. And you could tell in the fellowship, the talks were deeper. There were people huddled together, talking, solving, figuring things out. You know, kind of, I mean, I'm sure they solved all the problems in the world and in the church. Probably told no one, but they solved it all. I mean, the talks were just different. I mean, walking up to someone, hugging on, and all of a sudden, man, I'm having a dissertation on, on things. I heard more sermons in the fellowship that second half of the week than I heard in the conference, and that's saying something. 
But in between those two, there was just a worship night. Just, just a time of worship. Two hours long, and it had everyone there. The, uh, the, the college and, and singles were there. The, uh, the marrieds and the teens were there. Uh, and it was amazing. You know, and as this thing got started, there was, they left about 30 feet between the, the chairs and, and the stage. And they were saying, hey, if anyone would want to come up, and before he could even finish that statement, 1,200 young people <laughs> came and wrapped themselves around the stage. I was sitting in the fourth row, so, so right about where Nick was, and they were just kind of, they were kind of pushing us over, kind of scooting us out of the way, because they're young. You know, and my age did not impress them at all. You know, and they were just like, they, they were wanting to make it happen. And the worship music started and 1,200 young people started worshiping God. They were dancing with all of their might. They were, they were just going for it. And, you know, and again, you start to go, well, man, I can't be outdone by these young people. And so you start getting into it a little bit more. And, and they were just going. And for two hours, they never stopped. I sat down for many rest breaks, but they never stopped. And then at the end, at the end, 1,200 students, as they said, okay, guys, good night. 1,200 students started screaming out, men who dream, men who dream, men who dream, men, you know, and these, and these former kingdom kids who are trying to leave are like, what should we do? And they're like, I've never had an encore before for worship. And they all came out, finally one step forward, and just went, captives. And then the crowd took over. And all the people who had left, the band members started sticking their head out, saying, what's going on? They start coming back and go, I guess we're going to play some more. You know, and people are coming in. Uh, I'm not even sure they were on the worship team. They got up on stage, too. And for the next seven minutes... Because you time moments like this. For the next seven minutes, they were singing our anthem. But I can't say it's our anthem anymore. It's their anthem. And in that moment, I knew we were going to do just fine as a church. We're going to be okay. There's no need to worry. Because if you get your praise right, You'll eventually get it right. It was a moment where it was no longer on the page. Praise the Lord. It was in the persons that were leading us, the whole congregation, 1,200 nameless people, although my children were definitely in that mosh pit, <laughs> leading the way. And it occurred to me that's exactly what we need to aspire to as a congregation. I want to read a chunk of scripture because that way, in case you don't hear anything else, you have heard the word of the Lord. <laughs> but I, I want to read it because I'm trying to set up an obvious thing that Luke is doing. And so just kind of bear with me as I keep reading. You think, okay, he's probably going to stop here. I'm probably not. <laughs> I just want you to listen to the word and then I want to I want to ask that we kind of stop for a moment and really consider something that was where Jesus took it off the page and put it in the person. Luke chapter 3 beginning in verse 2. It says during the high priesthood of Aeneas and Caiaphas the word of the Lord came to John son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley will be filled in, every mountain and hillside made low. The, the crooked road shall become straight and the rough way smooth. And the people will see, the people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! 
Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God could raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What shall we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? He replied, don't exhort any uh, money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and all were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, <laughs> but one who, who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. The winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the patriarch, because of his marriage to Herodotus, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Do you see a little discrepancy in the amount of detail from one subject to the other? It's curious, right? Because Luke is a master storyteller. He's not going to add anything that's not important. I mean, think about all that we know about the birth narrative, right? I mean, most of this play that we're going to do is coming right out of Luke. We got a lot of singing. We even know the words to some of the songs they sing. I mean, that's specific. We have shepherds in the field, angels we have heard on high. We have, we have, we have all of this detail being given to us. Uh, we have Jesus in the temple when he was a little kid. And, and that, that whole debacle of a parenting devotional happens right there. Uh, we, have, we have all of this detail about John. But when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too? I mean, come on, John, (laughs) or come on, Luke. I mean, give us a little bit more than that. I mean, we know what kind of discussions uh, John the Baptist had with the people there. We know what was going on. But when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. It kind of gives me the impression, and I kind of hate to say this, but it gives me the impression, next slide, that Jesus was standing in a line. I don't know about you, but I hate lines. <laughs> lines just don't care. They don't care if you graduated magna cum laude or you graduated thank you lordy. Lines don't care what kind of tax bracket you're in or what neighborhood you went to. Lines just kind of level things out. And you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever taken your kids to Disney World or Disneyland, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get to the gate and they said, hey, would you like to buy a Fast Pass? I mean, they're trying to sell you on this idea. And you're like, well, let me think about it. How much? And then they tell you the price, and you're like, there is no way I'm buying a fast pass. But after a while, standing in those lines, you start wondering, is there a way to cut ahead? 
Is there a way? How much was that fast pass? You're starting to equate the time to, to ride value. You're like, that's actually not a bad deal because we'll do anything to get out of a line. <laughs> Plus, when you've waited a couple hours and you see someone coming up in one of those fake knee strollers, you know, they kind of come up and they kind of just go right ahead of you. You're like, man, we're doing that next time, next time. <laughs> Why? Because to have that power, to have that separation, to kind of have like, hey, the, 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 the son of man is actually coming through. Everyone clear away. Part the water. No, don't part the water. He's getting baptized. But you know what I'm saying. He could have done that, but Jesus didn't take the fast pass. When all the people were coming out to be baptized, Jesus also was baptized. What kind of story is that? I mean, when you read Mark, it's almost like there is no other person on the planet except John and Jesus. I mean, read it. I mean, it, it is like the stage has been cleared. No other players are involved, and John and Jesus are there. Man, Mark, uh, Matthew knows how to tell it. You know, Matthew, it says Matthew sees Jesus coming and goes, oh, oh, oh easy, cuz, easy, easy. I, 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 can't, I can't baptize you. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus is like, I'll oh, forget all that, man. I'm here for the people. And he baptizes them. Epiphanius, Epiphany, uh, an early church father said, you know, like the story he was told is that when Jesus came into a water, a bright light from heaven shined down and kind of showed Jesus off. That's how you tell the story, right? Jerome would say that he heard a tradition that when Jesus stepped up to the water, the, the whole Jordan River caught on fire. Now, that's how you tell the story. But when all the people are being baptized, Jesus was baptized too? It's almost like, it's almost like John was baptizing someone and went, Next! And there was Jesus. There was Jesus just with the people. Just side by side with them, in line. I, I don't know what, why, why Luke would tell it this way, unless, of course, there's something we're supposed to imitate in this. Because you know who was in this line? I'll tell you who was in that line. It's the Anawim. Next slide. The Anawim means, is a Hebrew word for poor ones. But it's got, it's got a rich history. That this, this term, anawim, is, it's found throughout the Old Testament and mostly in, in, in the book of Psalms, but also in this time when, the Babylon, when Babylon came and uh, destroyed Jerusalem and took them into captivity. You remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They took the best of the best. Well, they didn't take everyone. They left a certain group behind to work the land. That group had a name. It was the anawim. <laughs> The one's not good enough to take. This would not be a good investment for us to take these people. They're not worth it. You ever felt like that? Like you're part of the Anoim? I know I have. I remember one time I'd been in Albuquerque for a while. A job opportunity came up that was kind of in a hot hot spot area and someone reached out to me and says listen this uh this church needs some help and it's it's uh it's in a little bit of trouble but you have the right temperament you could be great i need you to send your resume and so i did i put myself out there i was gonna go for it i was like going wow this might be the lord's calling i'm gonna go and i i went out there and and uh and you know waited to hear i didn't hear I waited a little bit longer because any time a decision's that important, <laughs> they have to, it has to be prayerfully done. Still didn't hear, you know, and you kind of go, well, how long do they need to pray about this, you know? And so I waited until I was like, okay, that's it, I'm calling. And I called, you know what they said? Do you know what they said? <laughs> we decided it would be better to hire no one than to hire you. <laughs> that is on a weem. That is thanks, but no thanks. That is like, yeah, I hear you, bro. It's cute that you're doing what you're doing. Stay there. I mean, wow, right? On a weem. And we all feel like that at times, but there are those that are standing in that line that feel like that all the time. And Jesus is there with them because he's always there with them. Next slide. 
In fact, it was part of his very first sermon. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to Anawim is the word there. They're there in that line. And Jesus is right there with them because you want to know why? Because lines don't make distinctions. You know this from the DMV, don't you? <laughs> I, I've been there many times. I see people walk in and go, nope. <laughs> because it's just too much of a commitment to stand in that line. There is no distinction. They just don't care. You are all the same people at that point. You are there to get a license. You are there to do what you got to do to register, to re-up your tags or whatever. However you guys do it weirdly here in Missouri. But you're there and they just don't care. It's like, get in line. Next. When all the people were getting baptized, Jesus also was baptized. Right there. The Anawim are there. Of course, they're always going to be there because anytime someone comes and preaches the good news of the kingdom of God and that the price of admission is only repentance and baptism, the Anawim are going to be there. There is a hope their hearts are hungry for. There is something that, that, is, that is gnawing on them, saying, we got to get out of this. we got to get out of this. I mean, I heard this from a brother just this week. He called and left me a voicemail, one of the most troubling voicemails I've had here. Hey, bro, I'm at the laundromat. Some guns came out. I just wanted to let you know in case you don't hear from me. Click. What kind of, that's cruel. No follow-up call. Come on, bro. But do you hear the desperation? They just want to get out. And when the kingdom of God comes, not on the page, but in the person, that there's someone walking with them in that moment, there's someone walking with them in this season, that there is going to be a hope, that there's going to be wor- it's going to be worth it, that you hang on, not because you're guaranteed riches in this life, but you hang on because you can be made rich in relationship and with people that care, that will pour themselves out for your benefit. The Anawim are going to be there. Or at least they better be there. Or maybe the kingdom isn't being preached. Worse, the kingdom isn't being seen. And all the people will see the salvation of our God. Next slide. You know who, are there, who was there that day with John that kind of surprised me, though? Is the rich. Did you catch that? The crowds were there. They asked, what should we do? And, and John says, that anyone of you has two tunics? Tunics should share with those that have none. The rich were there. Why would the rich be there? Why would the rich abandon their their palatial palace? Why would the rich abandon their 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 their, their, their patios and their and their servants to go out to the desert to be baptized by John? Why would they be there? You know why they would be there. Because there is something oppressive about prosperity. There is a heaviness that comes when you've achieved life's goals and now you kind of go, is this it? When you have put stock in the fact that if I could just get out of this neighborhood, out of this tax bracket, into this, into this uh, amount of money, then I'll be happy. And then you get there and you realize that it's empty, that it's, that it's pointless, that it provided no more than what you have. In fact, now you have way more worries because everything costs so much more. The rich are going to be there. Because the rich go down to the market where they sell life and go, hey, can I buy a home? And the market says, a home? Oh, no, we can't sell you a home. We can sell you a nice house. Hey, can I buy some time? I'm kind of missing, I'm missing out on life because of all that I'm doing. Can I buy some time? <laughs> you can't buy time here. We'll say a nice watch, though. Syncs with your phone. <laughs> the rich will come and go, man, can, can someone show me some life-work balance? Can someone give me some peace? Can someone show me the place where I can buy some peace? And they're like, oh, no, we, we don't sell anything like that here. 
We got some Bibles. What translation would you like? See, the rich are there because when they look out on the field of life, they're just trying to figure out where, where is someone that's getting it right? Where's someone that has this joy, this peace, this patience, this kindness, this gentleness, this faithfulness, the fruits of the Spirit? Where are those people? I'll do anything to be with them. I'll do anything to get some of that. The rich are going to be there because they need to see it not on the page, but in the person that's standing right next to them in line. Next. Next slide. <laughs> you know who else is there? And this is a weird one, yeah. Yeah, the irreligious. The tax collectors. You know, tax collectors were their own degree of sinner back in the first century. You ever notice that? It was always sinners and tax collectors. Like, they get their own category of sinner. That is a special, you know, when I used to teach this in Metro, we actually had a tax collector who hated when I pointed that out, you know. But, but they were their own degree of sinner. They, they kind of looked at the way things are going. It's like going, man, it is too hard to try to carry the weight of all of these rules and, and still struggle every day to put something in our pot. I know what I'll do. I'll just sell out. I'll become Ru a Rome, Rome stooge. I will, I will just say, I'll tax my own people. I'll get Rome's share, and I'm going to get a little extra for me. And when you start to become the most hated person in the community, how do those exchanges start going? Well, last week I only needed $5 extra, but since you gave me attitude, it's going to be 15 today. And these tax collectors were hated. Why are they there with John? What drew them in to John? It was the fact that even though their past was marred with betrayal and hatred, here was someone who did not put a standard out that's saying you had, to, you had to be a certain way in order to be welcomed in. It was just repentance and baptism. You remember when Jesus walked up to the tax collector's booth and Levi was there? You remember what Jesus said to him? He said, follow me. Do you, do you hear what he didn't say? <laughs> Levi, you scoundrel of a man. <laughs> you cursor of people's happiness. You get yourself right. You, you turn it around and then come after me. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say... Levi, if you knew scripture at all, you know there is a special place for hell for someone like you. That's what the other rabbi said, but not this one. He came up and just said, follow me. You know what Jesus did? Do you, do you, do you see what Jesus did there? He said, Levi, why don't you come belong to me first? Why don't you come be a part of my group? And just belong for a little bit. We'll work on your belief systems. We'll, we'll get to your behavior. All I need from you right now is just to come with. Do you see why the tax collectors might be there? Because for the first time in human history, someone was suggesting that maybe the road to salvation is, let me pull you into a family of people that are living it out, then we'll work on your beliefs, then we'll work on your behaviors, but your first need is not to repent, your first need is to become. Come be a part of us. Come be welcomed in. So the tax collectors are there because they want, what they weren't hearing was anything other than what everyone else was hearing. For the first time, they weren't the special category of sinner. It was the entrance given to all. We all need to repent, so why don't you just come on in? And when the kingdom of God is preached like that, the tax collectors, the most vile, they'll show up for something like that. Next. <laughs> This is the one that I think should stop all of us. Yeah. 
Scholars have tried to convince us that these were temple guards. They weren't. These were straight up Roman guards. These were Roman soldiers. There's no way a temple guard would leave Jerusalem to go out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> to, to go stand with a bunch of people that they're trying to keep in order. There is no way, but Rome will send people out there because what if there's an uprising? You know, there's a strange prophet. They know what happens when people who claim to be prophets go out into the desert. They, they get an army together. And when they get an army, it means trouble for Rome, which then means trouble for Jerusalem. So Rome is there. They're there. And soldiers are there, and they're asking John a question. What shall we do? What? Why, why would this colossus of a man with helmet, breastplate, spear, sword, and shield, why would they even care? Well, you know why. Because at some point, they go home. And at some point, they take the armor off. And they lie down in a bed and they shake like some frightened son of a mother. Wondering, do I have what it takes? Am I enough? Will this whole journey matter to anyone? When the armor's off, the persona changes. And you know this. Because we're all like this. We're even like this when we come to church sometimes. We kind of come all armored up, kind of looking nice, got the hair, got the, got the outfit. We sit in the same areas because we know who we're going to interact with. We greet the same people because we know how they're going to respond. We've been doing this a while. And the soldiers are there because they, just like you, want to break through that. They want to be able to live life without the armor on all the time. Where can I go to, to just let it be known? Where can I go to be seen? Where can, I be go, where can I go where people really know me and I don't have to put up a front? When they come and hear the repentance being preached, when they talk about there is no need, you're all in the same line, you're all equal, the soldiers felt free to kind of go, I think I can take my armor off here. What do I need to do? And John's like, just be nice. <laughs> and the soldier's like, well, get me in that water. Soldiers are there, almost as the, the symbol of all of us Gentiles who would then come and go, I don't know how to approach the scriptures. I don't know how to do it. But when they saw it, not on a page, but in a person, man, the armor came off. And brothers and sisters, that's what it needs to be like in here. Next, the one that should shock all of us is the fact that the religious were there. All of them. All the various groups of first century Judaism had representatives there checking John out. The Essenes, which were the most extreme, that don't make the pages of the Bible because they were so withdrawn from culture. They felt like it's all got to burn before the Messiah would come. They wouldn't associate with anyone. But when John preached, we know from their writings, they were there. We know the Pharisees were there and the Sadducees were there because the other Gospels go ahead and tell us. They were the ones that probably got that warm, fuzzy greeting that John gave them. You brood of vipers. It's like, whoa, easy, easy. Why would the religious be there? What, what hunger drew them out there to get baptized? And I think this one's probably the most relatable. They were there because what the, what the church would call in later decades, Akadia, was a part of their daily existence. Akadia, it's one of the seven deadly sins. There was a time in church history where the, the church leaders felt like they needed to kind of categorize which sins are what. They had the, the lightweight sins, the welterweight sins, the, you know, the light heavyweight sins, and then the biggies, the biggies. They had seven of those. And one of them was Akadia. 
It's translated sloth, but that's really a bad translation. Sloth sounds like you're just moving too slow. Sloth, sloth sounds like, you know, you're hanging out in the jacuzzi too long. Sloth, sloth is not a good translation. A better translation is, I don't care. The religious are there. Because for first, the first time they saw their faith, someone living out their faith in action. And when you don't take action, after a while, your heart just gets hard. And you become prone to seeing people curled up in the balls in front of, front of stores. And you kind of go, well, they're not my kid. You see lonely people walking and feeding pigeons. And you go, well, it's not my dad. You start seeing that coworker kind of always tense, always thinking, you know, there's something wrong. And you know that if you just had a great talk with that person, you might be able to have a breakthrough. But you, but you don't. Why? Because it's not my friend. Wow. I don't care. Man, it's hard. Because you don't get that way because you wouldn't like you weren't trying at one point. You get that way because you've tried a little bit and it didn't work out the way you thought. And you just kind of gave up. I hear it from time to time in, in church leaders who are kind of a little bit on the, on the fry side. They're kind of fried up in their faith. Where people are leaving, you kind of go, bro, what, what's going on? How can I help? I don't care. I don't chase anyone anymore. Mm, Acadia. English would later adopt this word and just call it apathy. It's easy to fall into it. Assuming everyone's got, got it all figured out up there. Assuming that that the things that you have to offer that you know in your heart are true and gospel, that those things somehow don't match the world that is in need of this. And you forget we're all in the line. We're all heading somewhere. It just doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what we're accomplishing. Doesn't matter what, what we're doing. We as, as humanity, we're all being gathered at some point. And there's Jesus. When all the people were getting baptized, Jesus also was getting baptized. Next. They're all in the line. Every single one of them. The poor, the rich, the irreligious, the religious. The soldiers, all desperate for something. The world is still just in a line, being marched towards an end that they're, that they're trying to convince themselves that there's nothing on the other side, being marched towards a, a reality that they're convinced that the only reality is the one that I make up for myself. They're all being herded. They're all being pushed. They're all being prodded. They're all being sent somewhere, and someone needs to step up and go, I'm not just going to sit here and look at the page and not try to live it out. I want to roll up my sleeve and get right in between those guys. I want to be right there because right there is where Jesus would be. In the midst, in the middle, doing the things that they would understand. Living in a way that they could grab hold of. As John would say it next. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus was not ashamed to stand in the line. And this is hard because sometimes, like I said, we hate lines. There was a time when I was a young church leader in Albuquerque. I was asked to come and do this awesome campus conference in the Southwest. It was a big event. It was like my first real big event. And, you know, and this event was so big, we had literally hundreds of college students from all around the Southwest coming in. And one of the things we wanted to do was to do a service project for those. It was in Phoenix in the summer because... 
That's what you do to college students. You put them on the hottest place on the planet and say, come on. And so we're, we're, doing, this, uh, we're doing this outreach program to, to, uh, to feed the homeless for the day. And so we were there, and, uh, it, and I, I, had, I had like a, a morning meeting to kind of get ready for the conference. The college students were there making it happen. I show up to, to where the, the soup line was, or, and I got there, and they were like, well, Bill, we got it all covered. Uh, why don't you just go in and be with the folks? Okay, well, you don't need me to do anything. I was kind of putting on gloves at that point. They're like, no, 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 we got it. Why don't you just go, go sit with, uh, with the people having lunch? I went, oh, okay. And, and I did, but there was a line. I had to go stand in line, 250 people right off the street. Coming into this line, and there I was standing with them. Kind of feeling awkward. Hey, how's, how's it going? Don't know what to ask because I'm not sure I wanted to know where they were from, because I was afraid it would look presumptuous. You know, Where are you from? Right over there. So I'm just kind of minding my own, getting to know some people's names, and we're standing in the line, and got into a line, and there was a, you know, a scoop of vegetables. I'm not sure what the vegetables were, but a scoop of vegetables, a sandwich, a soda, and an apple took my tray and, you know, they just kind of had those bare, you know, kind of lunchroom tables and they were all there and you just kind of followed the line and you sat wherever you sat and, you know, I sat down and, you know, across from me was a guy who was kind of, you know, he, his clothes were actually kind of nice. You know, not, didn't have the suit jacket on, but he had a suit jacket and he, you could tell he'd been sleeping in it. So it was, he was a mess. But there was, and so I kind of, I kind of ventured out and said, "So, uh, what do you, you come here often?" And he goes, "No. No, actually, uh, I was here again. Uh, my my daughter said I could live with her for 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 a time if I would stay if I would stay sober because she didn't want her kids around a drunk old man. Is what he said." And I, would, I did great for a couple of weeks, but, but it got me, and, you know, I'm here again. And then he asked, how about you? What do you do? And I'm like, well, I'm from, from Albuquerque, and I'm a, I'm a minister. And he goes, ha, man, that bottle could get us all. <laughs> I know, that's exactly how I felt. And I wanted to stand up and all that, 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 that Coke can kind of kind of get everyone's attention. Hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not one of you. I, I, I wanted to get up. I wanted to, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm just here trying to serve, trying to be a good Christian. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that, that they knew. I, I mean, there was a part of me that wouldn't do it, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You want to know why? Because I knew it wouldn't have been true. It just wouldn't be true. Because just like all of them, every day I wake up, I wake up to the grace of God. <laughs> and even though I've tried, uh, to my shame, I've tried every day to try to find someone I'm better than, I've never been able to do it. Everyone's in the line. Everyone needs the word becoming flesh and doing life among them. And I realize that if I don't embrace that as my highest calling as a Christian, to live my full faith out in the midst of people in the line, if I don't get in that line and play the part I was meant to play, I might not get in. Next. All right. It's a great lesson. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate you. Just going to do a quick response here while the worship team comes out. But wasn't that awesome? See, Bill, Bill has a way, uh, has a way, uh, has a way of talking in echoes. 
like in your heart. But but it, it reminded me of a story. I really appreciated the the, the, the end there. It reminded me of, first of all, the scripture, we all fall, uh, fall short. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But it was a really good story. Um, and it was this guy. He was a great guy in town or whatever. And I forget where I heard this from, but, you know, these people started bad-mouthing him and all that kind of stuff. And then he got... Um, all these all these guys like followers are like dude like they're speaking poorly of you they're speaking terribly of you like you know like what are you gonna do and, and they're like if only they really knew you man and he was like yeah if only they really knew me then they'd have an even longer list of things to say about me and I love what you said at the end it's like you know we're all we're all on that line and and uh, just the thought of the the first question that you asked like, what does the world really need um, and it just made me think, you know, does the world need to read Jesus or does the world need to see Jesus? Um, you know, and I think does the world need to see, hear people who like, you know, come in and they're that playing church and it's that like every good. Sunday, like, oh, I'm just in the pews and doing my thing and, and all that kind of stuff. But then but then Monday through Saturday, you know, the, the interactions are, are selective. The interactions are, you know, uh, they're 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 not like Jesus. And I think when you look in Scripture, you do see Jesus was in the interaction and, and he made people feel an unusual acceptance and an unusual love um, that stood out um, and that that allowed them to to kind of be taken to a place where they're kind of taken a little bit off guard, not because of yelling or not because of of of, of abuse, but really because of that unusual. Like, I wonder where that's coming from, you know. And so, hey, during the week, as people interact with you, are they are they seeing Jesus and are they feeling that unusual love and that acceptance? So one more time for Bill. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, we are going to end with a song. And I'm going to slide. Oh. All right. So I'll stand. Shake your shoulders a little bit. Come on now. Right, you guys know the words of this song, right? We're going to clap with Jesus. We're going to walk with Jesus. And we're going to dance with Jesus, right? So I want to see you guys clapping, walking, and dancing. Amen? Everybody clap your hands, come on. Aina ita poco te la, ita poco te la mavoco. Aina ita poco te la, ita poco te la mavoco. Aina ita poco te la, ita poco te la mavoco. We're singing, si curing wana o si esu uta boya. Si curing wana o si esu uta boya. Alright, now let's walk with Jesus. Come on. Aina ita pama pama ita pama pama na Yesu. Fama fama ita fama fama na Yesu. Ina ita fama fama ita fama fama na Yesu. We're singing si kuring wana o si Yesu uta boya. Boy, I see you in 
now. This is my favorite part. Let's dance with Jesus. Amen. Ina ita china china ita china china na Yesu. Come on. Ina ita china china ita china china na Yesu. Wana o si Yesu uta boya. Siguri wana o si Yesu uta boya. Siguri wana o si Yesu uta boya. Ina ita yimelela, ita yimelela, Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Ina ita yimelela, ita yimelela, Hosanna. Hosanna, oh, Hosanna, 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 Three, two, one, and Hosanna, 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 Hosan